Hello, welcome back to Drinking by My Shelf. My name is Emma and today you might notice something a little different about me. I am wearing glasses and that is because this Valentina Books is sponsored by Glasses USA. So Glasses USA sell so many different frames and brands of glasses. I'll put a link in the description box below to their website so you can go browse yourself. They've got such an amazing selection and browsing their website is so much fun. I did this for hours because you can actually upload a picture of yourself and then virtually try on all the different frames and see what you're going to look like in them. It's a lot of fun. I actually ended up with four different frames because I just couldn't choose, so I'm gonna show them all to you throughout this video. And what's really cool about the ones I've got is that I actually don't need vision correction anymore because I got laser eye surgery a few years ago. So these are actually blue light blockers. So they're amazing for using when you're using the computer, particularly late at night. I've actually been wearing them all day, every day in front of the computer at work. Some of you noticed that I was wearing them in my Reading Rush vlogs that I posted last week and genuinely like, they help so much. I've been sleeping so much better when I've been on my computer late at night wearing the glasses. It doesn't affect my sleep patterns at all. I also just like don't feel as worn out by the end of the work day. I'm not getting headaches. They're just great. But you can of course get prescription glasses through Glasses USA as well. They actually have this app, which is incredible. I don't know how it works, but where you can scan your existing eyeglasses if you don't have your prescription with you and it will extract the prescription information. And you can also get so many different options for the lenses like anti-scratch, UV protection, polarized for sunglasses. They have sunglasses as well, which we'll get to because I did get a pair. Basically, they're great, really cool website. So like I said, click on the link and go check it out. Shipping is free within the US, but they do of course also ship to the UK because I have them here. So the first two pairs I'm gonna show you, these ones I'm wearing now were the first ones I chose because these look the most similar to the glasses that I used to wear when I used to wear prescription glasses. I will put in a little clip here. When I first, first, first started YouTube, was right before I got laser eye surgery. So you will see me wearing glasses a bit like this in those early videos. So that's why I started by choosing these because these are the ones that I like felt most comfortable in. But then I decided for my second pair to go a bit outside the box. I also look at this. So it came with a cleaner that says, don't use your t-shirt, which is so perfect because I always use my t-shirt to clean my glasses and now I don't have to. So this pair are called the Muse Arkansas. I will put links to like each frame style that I chose in case you wanted those. And then for something very different, the next frames I chose were the Ototo Daniele. So these ones are a little bit outside my comfort zone, but I kind of love them. They're like very retro. I think they make me look kind of like an old lady, but in a way that I'm into. Also they're rose gold and I just can't resist anything rose gold. So let's get on with balancing the books and I'll show you the other pairs later in the video. So balancing the books, if you're new here, is the game where every month I balance everything that came onto my TBR with everything that went off my TBR and try and make that number zero or preferably try and actually lose books from my TBR. We're trying to make it smaller. At the beginning of July I started with 52 books on my TBR. So we want to get that number down. Throughout the month I did haul eight books. So let's go through them. The first book I hauled on Kindle and that was The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre, which is so off-brand for me. So I am in a book club in real life with my friends from uni and we take turns picking a book. And so the girl who's picking this month chose The Spy and the Traitor, which is very much outside my comfort zone. So it's non-fiction, I don't read much non-fiction anyway, and it's a like Cold War spy story. It's apparently amazing. Like for the genre that it's in, I've heard that it's incredible and that it reads like fiction. The problem for me is that I wouldn't read fiction about a Cold War era spy anyway. That's just so not my thing. So I will update you on that one when I get to it. I've got one more week to go into the book club, so I actually really need to read it this week. But in the past, anytime that someone in my book club has picked a book that I didn't want to read, I have ended up loving it. So who knows, maybe next month you'll see me on Balancing the Books absolutely raving about this one, but I'm not particularly excited. Then I hauled the Percy Jackson series. So I was sent these by bookstodoor.com. I will put a link below to the video I made for them, which was a 24-hour readathon where I read all five of these books. Books to Door is this amazing website where they sell box sets and series like this for literally incredible prices. So go and check them out. I only have four of them here because I guess in that video I did a good enough job of convincing my friend that she wants to read them too. So she has borrowed the first one. I have the last four here. But I did read all five. And 
You know what? I was surprised. I never thought I was going to love them. This is like middle grade fantasy, which is just not really my thing. But the books are based on Greek mythology, which is my thing. And so I found I had a good time. So the premise of the series, if you don't know, which I didn't, is that Percy Jackson is an ordinary teenage boy until he finds out right at the beginning of the first book that he is actually a demigod. He is a son of one of the Greek gods. And so he has to go to the summer camp for other demigods. And each book he has a different mission or adventure he has to go on, there is an overall prophecy that links all the books together, and it's actually a lot of fun. So if you're into fantasy series, I think you will absolutely love it. It was never going to be my favourite favourite because it's just not really my genre, but I had a really good time with it. By the way, I'm sorry if there is a lot of background noise going on. There is building work going on next door, but I would usually shut the window so you couldn't hear it, but it is so hot that I just literally can't. Even with the windows open, I am melting. We are in the middle of a heat wave right now, and I am not good with heat. And then I hauled these two books, Sun is Sky by Jenna Mabry and Little Suns by Zeg Zinder. So these two both came from Jacaranda Books. They are a black owned publisher. I actually ordered these about two months ago, I think, um, which was the first time I heard of Jacaranda Books because they were running this fundraiser along with another black owned bookshop. And so I donated to the fundraiser and also went to check out their website and found so many good books on there. I bought this one as well of Murder Muses and Me, but that arrived before, so I've already hauled that one. There was so much demand for their books because so many people discovered them through this fundraiser, which is really cool. So it actually ended up taking quite a while for the books to reach me because they ran out of stock. But they did finally arrive this month. So can I even remember what these are about? I know they looked exciting. Little Sons is set in 1903 and it's a man searching for the woman that he fell in love with 20 years earlier. And Sun is Sky is about three generations of women. I love that kind of thing. I exactly remember why I bought this. So we have a teenager, Penny Hill, who has a really difficult relationship with her mother and ends up going to live with her maternal grandmother instead. But there are all of these intergenerational secrets and legacies and yeah both of these books sound brilliant so I will update you as soon as I've read them. So those are all of my new hauls this month but then of course I also read a bunch of books that I already had on my TBR. So let me show you the next pair of glasses before I talk you through those. So these next ones I got really excited about because these were actually designed by Hilary Duff and I love Hilary Duff. I was a big Lizzie McGuire fan. So these are called the Clara frames. As you can tell, I couldn't resist all of the pink frames they had on offer. They do obviously have other colours you can choose from. So books I read in the month of June. I read Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Laurie Gottlieb. So Laurie Gottlieb is a therapist and this book is a story about her experience as a therapist and also her experience of going to therapy which all therapists are required or encouraged to do. So I really enjoyed this book. I don't think I loved it, but that might partly be because I listened to it as an audiobook. And for some reason, I never fall in love with books on audio to the same extent. But as someone who has had a lot of therapy, <laughs> I've been to a lot of different therapists. I've had a lot of therapy throughout most of my adult life, to be honest. It was really, really interesting hearing another perspective of it, hearing the other side of what it's like for the therapist and there were certain things that I found really fascinating she said like that for her every therapy session where she's in the role of therapist is almost like a therapy session for herself like she will get something out of every session I thought that was really interesting it was also just fascinating thinking of therapists as real people I think that I have always thought that they must be these like incredibly enlightened people who don't have issues of their own but obviously that's not true so I really liked listening to Laurie Gottlieb, well it wasn't her narrating the book, but her words, talking about how she would sometimes be in sessions with clients and find herself thinking like, I don't like this person, <laughs> for example, and like noticing these thoughts that she would have, but that that didn't make her any less good of a therapist. Also the fact that it's really hard as a therapist to apply what you know, like your training, to your real life and your real friendships. So in a session, her role as a therapist is basically to sit there with the person and their emotions. Whereas in her real life, if she had a friend who would call her in floods of tears because her boyfriend dumped her, she would find herself like trying to fix it, being like, I know someone I can set you up with, you know, like really trying to solve it and doing anything other than just sitting with the person and their emotions. So just because she's incredibly well trained to do that in a work environment, doesn't mean that she suddenly is this person who just floats through life feeling incredibly enlightened and chill. And I really liked that. It actually got me all inspired to go and take a counselling course myself to train as a counsellor, which I'm still trying to get onto one. So I'll keep you posted on that. 
and also in some ways did read a bit like a fiction book. So we meet quite a few of her different patients. Some of them have more recurring scenes than others and we really get a sense of their arc. She did say that obviously like for confidentiality reasons, they're slightly fictionalised. So some of them are different patients she had merged together with significant details changed and stuff. So I guess in that way, it was like reading a narrative arc. And Laurie Gottlieb, before she was a therapist, actually worked in TV development. So she obviously is very good at telling a story. So yeah, I'm really glad I read it. I found it really interesting and helpful. It's not a self-help book. I think from the title, maybe you should talk to someone. It sounds like it's going to be a self-help book, but it isn't at all. It's a story but it's a story that I definitely took some useful advice from. Then I read Not Forgetting the Whale by John Ironmonger. So this was a book that hit so scarily close to home. It is about a global financial collapse caused by a flu pandemic. So it is incredibly close to the bone, but I really enjoyed it actually. And I didn't find it a book that was scary to read right now because actually the way it plays out is very, very different from how it has played out in reality for us. So you guys will know yourselves better. Some people might find it something that's stressful to read right now, but I personally was okay with it other than when I first realized what it was about because it didn't say that on the blurb. So I was like a third of the way through when suddenly it's revealed what this book is going to be about and that felt like this terrifying sinking sensation, <laughs> but actually it was fine. And it's a really fun book. It's a very optimistic book. I think I gave it about a three out of five in the end, maybe because the way this flu pandemic plays out is so different from ours that I felt like I couldn't quite relate to it because it wasn't going the way that I saw in reality things have actually gone. But it's a really hopeful, optimistic version of events, which is obviously very nice to read. And it's got this wonderfully quirky cast of characters. It's set in a small Cornish town, tiny, tiny Cornish town. So you get like these eccentric village locals and you kind of love all of them. Then I read Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl by Andrea Lawler. So this is a really fun book. This is set in the 90s and it's about a main character called Paul who is a shapeshifter and can change his body and his gender at will. And so through him, we get to go on this kind of tour of different 90s queer subcultures. Because of the way that he can alter the way he presents, we can go with him to, from everywhere to like a leather bar to an all-female festival. It's got a lot of sex in it, like very, very graphic, explicit sex. So, you know, not everybody likes that, but it's like a very um, sex positive, like joyful approach to sex. There's no shame in it. I also just loved Paul as a character. He's supposed to be a little bit insufferable and he is, he's kind of the worst, but I just really fell in love with him as a character. And just in general, this book's exploration of sex and gender was just brilliant. It really makes you question everything that you think about sex and gender. So Paul, the whole way through the book, he uses male pronouns and he thinks of himself as a he the whole time, even while he spends months at a time living in a female body in a relationship with a lesbian and considering himself in a lesbian relationship at that point called Polly, he still thinks of himself as a he who is also a woman. The author, Andrea Lawler, is actually non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, but I thought it was really interesting just exploring the different ways in which gender fluidity can exist. Um, yeah, it just really, it, it doesn't let anything sink into one particular label or one particular box. So it felt like reading this book, I was just constantly having my mind opened and it's just really fun along the way. Okay, then we're getting into all the books I read for The Reading Rush. So if you watched my vlogs, you would have seen these books before, but I feel like in those videos, I never do a very good job of actually explaining what the book's about. So I will give you a full review of all of them here, but like skip if you feel like you already got the gist from The Reading Rush vlog. So this is The House Without Windows by Barbara Newhall Follett, who wrote this when she was 12 years old, is that right? She was just this incredible and incredibly strange little child who wrote this best-selling book when she was 12 that's about a little girl running away from home and going to live in nature. So the house without windows is the great outdoors. First she wants to live in a meadow, then she sees the sea and feels this calling that she has to be there, then she sees the mountains and realises that she has to be up there, and it's got such beautiful descriptions of nature 
I cannot believe it was written by a 12 year old. I don't have a vocabulary like that now. And this edition that I have here that I was given for Christmas last year actually has got illustrations from Jackie Morris. So let me just look how pretty, look at these beautiful end papers. It's got these kinds of gorgeous illustrations the whole way through. And Barbara Newhall Follett actually went missing when she was about 25. She at that point hadn't published a book in years and she was married and she just walked out of the house where she lived with her husband and was never seen again. So it's rather a sad story, but very mysterious. And from reading this book, you find yourself just so wanting to believe that she went off into the meadows and the sea and the mountains and became a little kind of woodland nymph like Eposip, which is the wonderfully strange name of the main character in this. I just love to think of her going off and living in the wild rather than anything tragic that might have happened. So there it is, very strange book, but I loved it. I read it all in one sitting and I do really recommend it actually. I think I liked it more because I knew the context around it. So that really helps your enjoyment, but it's also just beautifully written. Okay, and then I read Of Murder, Muses and Me. So this was the third book that I got from Jacaranda Books. This is a murder mystery. So we have a main character called Rosalind, who is completely obsessed with this writer, famous author called Mark Waterloo. No, that's not true. He's called Mark Drubenheimer. She is called Rosalind Waterloo. Anyway, who cares? Mark Drubenheimer, right at the beginning of the book, is found dead, seemingly having killed himself. And Rosalind will not accept that this happened. She knows that he must have been murdered. And so she sets out to try and solve the mystery. Her father is actually this author's literary agent, but her and her father have this very difficult relationship and he refuses to help her. He has a new girlfriend who was this author's editor who says that she will help, but she keeps like actually being quite unhelpful. She meets all sorts of weird characters in this book. And I think the book was so strange, but that was what was so charming about it is it's got this incredibly eccentric cast of characters. The editor, who's her father's girlfriend, is maybe my favorite. She's like so full of herself in just the best way. She's just a glorious character. And what I ended up feeling about this one that I definitely said in the vlogs as well is plot wise, I loved it. Like the story unfolds in such a great way. Characters, I absolutely loved. The writing style is strange. It's It works really well because the writing style reminds me a lot of a kind of old fashioned murder mystery story, but it also is weird. And it means that all of the characters, all of their dialogue with each other is very, very strange. And so you find it hard to actually relate to anyone, including our main character. I loved kind of observing the characters and laughing at them, but I didn't ever feel like I was inside anybody's head, which gave me this slightly detached feeling going through the book. So I gave it a four stars. I really, really enjoyed it, but I was just slightly bemused the whole way through. Then I read The Psychology of Time Travel by Kate Mascarenhas. This one was a birthday present from what Victoria read, and this one was so much fun. I love time travel stories, but I'm really, really picky about them. And this one definitely made the cut. I absolutely loved it, so much fun. At first, we start in 1967, where this group of female scientists have invented a time machine. And one of them, called Barbara, basically has a mental breakdown from time traveling too much. It messes with her head. So she's kicked off the project. In 2017, we then meet up with her as an old lady. She's a grandmother and she receives this mysterious note from the future. So at this point in 2017, time travel is a thing. It's very commonplace. Um, it's quite elite. So there's this company that run time travel and it's a very elite profession, but it's definitely like known about by the whole population. So Granny B, who is Barbara, the original scientist, has had nothing to do with time travel all this time, but she receives a note from the future warning her of a, an old woman's murder that's going to happen about six months down the line. And then we also jump to six months down the line and see the aftermath of this murder. And it ends up being this wonderfully complicated murder mystery story where you have to keep going back and forth in time to put all of the pieces together. There's so much going on in this book. It's a really like genre bending one. So it's a murder mystery, it's sci-fi. It's also like quite a dark, deep story about the company that are in charge of time travel and all of the corruption and darkness within the company is kind of this big like conspiracy theory novel. It's also got romance elements. There's a lot of LGBT romance in here, which I loved. So like the main love story that you're rooting for is between two women. There's quite a few different ones going off on different threads as well. Yeah, I just loved it. Really, really recommend this one. It was a lot of fun. And Kate Mascarenhas has just written another book, which is coming out this year, and I've already added it to my Goodreads TBR, even though I don't even know what it's about. I just know that I love her writing, I love her characters, I love her way of bending and merging different genres together. 
she's just great. And then my first five star read of the month, Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid. So I absolutely raved about this one already in my vlog. I will link to that because I talked for about 10 minutes about it. So I don't need to repeat all of that. I am considering doing a standalone video about it because there's just so much to say, but I actually want to read the book again and make loads of notes so that I can cover all of the things I want to talk about. But as a quick overview in case you didn't watch the vlog already. This is about a young 20 something black girl called Amira who works as a babysitter for this rich white influencer woman called Alex. And the kind of catalyst at the start of the book is that Alex calls her really late at night when she's out at a birthday party and says we have this emergency can you come and just quickly take the little two-year-old girl Briar um, just take her out while we sort out this emergency that's happened at the house. And so Amira comes and does that. She takes her to a nearby grocery store just to keep her entertained. And while she's there, she is challenged by a security guard and another customer who assume that she must have stolen the child because the child is a little white girl. They don't trust Amira and her friend who are both black, who are dancing, who are you know dressed because they were out at a birthday party. And so they challenge them in this incredibly tense and scary scene for Amira. So that's right at the beginning. Okay, real quick, the building works were getting so loud I just had to shut the window. So if I start actually dripping sweat for the rest of this video, you'll know why. As I was saying, that scene is right at the beginning and the rest of the book then continues to switch between Amira's perspective and Alix's perspective. Alix is this white woman who sees herself as a white ally. She knows she hasn't done everything right and she, from her perspective, is genuinely trying to change and improve. And she is not villainized by Kylie Reid at all, but what Kylie Reid does really cleverly is just throw suspicion on her and her motives. So we learn quite early on that the emergency they had, which is why they had to call Amira to come take their child, is a rock was thrown, or rather an egg was thrown through their window because Alix's husband, who is a newscaster, accidentally said something racist on air, which obviously offended people. And so we know that Alix, who has this successful business, she's an influencer, is obviously very worried about her image. And so every decision she makes, every move she makes to try and right the situation is, yes, partly inspired by a genuine desire to make things better, but also inspired by her desire to be seen as an ally. There is so much more that happens in this book that I can't go into without revealing spoilers, which I really don't want to do because um, uncovering what's going on was just so exciting every step of the way. But there is one more white character who becomes very significant in Amira's life, um, who has the same treatment. You know, he is not villainized, but we do get this suspicion thrown on him and his motivations. And it's such a wonderfully complex book and a very uncomfortable read, I think. Very, you know, important but uncomfortable read. As a white reader, for me, I kept seeing myself in these white characters and having to acknowledge the ways in which, while I do want the world to be more fair and just and safe for black people, I also have been motivated in the past and continue to be motivated in some of the things I do by wanting to show, like, look, I'm one of the good people. And why does that matter? Like, nothing I do should be to make myself look good. It should only be to genuinely improve the world. So it's absolutely wonderful. And I loved being in both Amira and Alix's head. Being in Amira's head is really interesting because she can see what both of these white characters in her life are doing. But she also has to navigate what's the right path for her and becomes very frustrated when both of these characters, by trying to protect her from what they see as racism from other people but aren't recognising in themselves, become quite controlling over what she is and isn't allowed to do. This is definitely one of the best books I've read this year, definitely going to be one of my most recommended, and Kylie Reid is just such a wonderful writer, particularly a writer of characters. She has every character in this book down, even down to their speech patterns. They are all fully real people who you understand even if you don't always like them, or you kind of like them against your will in a way because once you understand someone as fully human, you have no choice but to like them to a certain extent, even while disagreeing with what they do. It's just, it's just so clever. Okay, then I read The Aisawa Murders by Riku Onda, which I really, really wanted to like and really didn't. So this is a story about a mass murder that happened in the 70s in Japan, a, a fictional one. So in this story, there was a party going on at the house of this rather wealthy local family and 17 people died from poisoning in their drinks. 
So that happened in the 70s. Ten years after that, a local woman wrote a book about it. And we are now in roughly present day piecing together different testimonials from people who were at the party, people who knew the people who owned the house, trying to figure out what happened because this murder was never solved. And I just, I just didn't like it. I think a lot of it went over my head. It's the kind of book that I imagine if you read it super, super slowly with a fine tooth comb and wrote down notes the whole way, you would find loads of really clever connections. But that's just not the way I read. I like books that require you to do a bit of work, but this required me to do so much work that I ended up getting nothing out of it. I got to the end of the book and was just like, huh, I don't know what that was about. Um, and someone like commented on my Goodreads review of it being like, you obviously weren't paying attention. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's probably true, but okay. I think some people will absolutely love this book and I think some people will get more from it. And the writing was good, I enjoyed the writing, but for me, I'm such a character reader. I care so much less about plot than I do about people. And these were not characters that you are supposed to feel attached to or understand in any way. And so however good the plot was, even if I could figure out the plot, it was never gonna bring this book back for me because I just didn't care about the characters. And then finally, the last one I finished literally on the last day of July, this one was chosen for me by my patrons. I got it for my birthday this year for my parents and then my patrons voted for me to read it, My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. This was another five star. I absolutely loved this one. So this is about a woman called Vanessa who, when she was 15, was in a sexual relationship with a much older teacher at her boarding school. And she, we meet her as an adult now in present day, and she looks back on their relationship as a love story. She acknowledges that it was complicated, she acknowledges that she is suffering some trauma from it, but she does not see herself as having been abused. And at the time in present day when we meet up with her, other girls who were also abused by this teacher are now coming forward with their stories, and they are contacting her and asking her to join them in calling out this man and what he did, and she refuses because she's still in touch with him, she still views him as this great love story in her life. And the story flashes back and forwards between present day and back when she was 15 and started this relationship and the next few years of her life as this relationship went on through her teenage years. And it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking seeing the ways in which she has to see herself as having been in charge of this relationship in order to survive, in a way. Just like he, the teacher, who is so creepy and awful, by the way, I just like shudder every time I even think about him now, he is so manipulative, and I'm sure for himself, he has to see her as having been the one in charge in order to make peace with himself, and he then manipulates her into feeling the same way. He gaslights her, he changes the story a bit, he convinces her that things were her ideas when they weren't, and for her own survival, it, it works for her to believe him because it makes her feel like the strong one, not like the person who was abused, which is a, a horrible thing to live with. And so it's an incredibly complex book and it's about the way, the way so many different people failed her as a child. So there was this man who was the most obvious villain, but also the way the school massively failed her and didn't protect her from this the way her parents, with good intentions, failed her. And then even in present day, the way that the um, you know sudden cultural movement of people speaking up against their abusers, which is, which is obviously a good and positive thing, but it's complicated in this book because for her, it's, she finds it incredibly traumatic and it forces her to reopen these wounds that she isn't ready to explore. It's a really, really powerful and dark book and definitely opens up conversations about the different ways to be a victim. It's, it's very good, but you know, make sure you're in the right frame of mind to read it, trigger warnings for sexual assault, it's a horrible book, but a wonderful book. One more pair of glasses. I also chose myself a pair of sunglasses. And again, these were from the collection designed by Hilary Duff. Couldn't resist. How cool are these? I am absolutely in love with these. And I am very excited to get out of this very hot room and go and sit wearing these in the garden for the rest of the afternoon. So the last book to mention doesn't do anything for my TBR score because it was a reread, but for the reading rush right at the end, I reread The Last Hedgehog by Pam Ayres, which is a little poem about the last hedgehog on earth, and it's very sad. And it's about the last hedgehog and all of the ways in which his family died, and now he's going to die. 
and right at the end it's got little tips for how to make your garden more friendly to hedgehogs. So it's a really sweet little book with these gorgeous illustrations the whole way through. Let's find one of my favourites. Look, there's a cute little love story picture between two hedgehogs. So this book is Vab. Whew! So overall that brings me down from 52 books on my TBR to 46 books on my TBR which is an improvement. It's still actually more books than I had at the start of the year, which is definitely going against the whole point of balancing the books. I did have my birthday though, and I got quite a lot of books for my birthday. So hopefully by next month, we'll be back on a firm decline. So thank you for watching and do go and look in the description box below for all of the information on how you can get your own cool Hilary Duff designed glasses or sunglasses of your own. And I'll see you guys soon. Cheers.